everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad that so many of you guys could make it tonight. Welcome to Grand Rounds with Motivate MD. My name is Emma. I will be lecturing you guys tonight on a topic that I'm really excited about. Um, so I'm a fourth year medical student currently interviewing for um, a residency position in emergency medicine. So the topic that we're going to talk about tonight has a lot to do with emergency treatments. So it's going to be good. Um, in addition to myself, uh, we have Becca Porter joining us here tonight. She is going to be helping moderate the chat. So if you guys ever have any questions during the presentation, um, feel free to interrupt me if you guys want. Otherwise, um, go ahead and put your question in the chat. Before, my name is Emma. I'm a fourth year medical student. I am going into emergency medicine. So tonight's topic has a lot to do with that. We're going to be talking about tension pneumothorax. So I hope you guys are excited and <clears throat> that this is inspiring for you. Um, so let's get started. All right, so you should have been emailed um, a link to fill out a form, and that's something that you should do as we're going through this case here together tonight. Um, this is a great way for you guys to get familiar with a SOAP note. And for those of you who don't know what a SOAP note is, it's the documentation that physicians use when they interact with patients. It's like the record keeper for electronic health records. So yeah, make sure that you fill that out to the best of your ability. It doesn't have to be perfect by any means, but when you do, you will be entered for a chance to win a very cool Motivate MD planner, so you don't want to miss out. And then um, in the left corner is the outline, so this is just the format for today's talk. I'm going to go through a case together, um, and then I'm going to dive into the physical exam, differential diagnoses, um, assessment and plan, and then talk a little bit about the pathology of the disease um, itself. And then here's a, what the form will look like. And then um, if you guys didn't see, Becca put a link to it in the chat. You guys, I couldn't resist. <laughs> happy Valentine's Day or almost happy Valentine's Day. Let's do this. A 22 year old male presents to the emergency department by ambulance with a chief complaint of stab wound to the right chest. As the patient is wheeled into the trauma bay, you observe that he is unconscious and the knife is still in place. The EMS, Emergency Medical Service, personnel inform you that the patient recently lost consciousness. As the medical team gets him hooked up to the monitor and you start your primary survey, ABCs, which we'll talk about in a second, you realize that he is becoming hypoxemic and suffering from cardiorespiratory compromise. So I want to first ask you guys, does anybody know what the primary survey means or what that entails for um, trauma cases? And if you could um, unmute yourself, that would be easier for me. In reference to the acronym ABC, is it airway, breathing, and circulation? Yes. Yep. Very good. Awesome. Good. Yeah. And, and that's essentially what the primary survey is too. Very good. Does anybody have an idea of what's going on? Um, it seems like he's low on oxygen. Mm -hmm. he's yeah, very good. Any other thoughts? That's okay. Let's keep going. As the emergency resident physician, you guys, you use your clinical judgment to determine that the patient needs immediate treatment in order to survive. Before performing the life-saving procedure, you take only a few seconds to share your differential diagnosis with your attending to ensure that you're making the right decision. Does anybody have a guess about what procedure we need to perform to save the patient? This is a hard question. I don't expect you guys to know. No guesses? Just, just a guess would be emergency airway access. That's a very good guess. That's a very good guess. All right. Would, uh, fighting infection. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, would fighting infection be another one because the uh, patient was stabbed? 
fighting an infection. Yeah. It's not, that is not a bad thought at all. Typically an infection would take longer to develop. Um, and I apologize yeah. that this wasn't clear um, from the beginning, but it, this was something that happened like briefly before the patient was brought to the emergency department, but not a bad yeah. thought at all. Good. All right, guys. So let's talk about the differential diagnosis. So first on the list, obviously, we have tension pneumothorax. Does anybody know why a tension pneumothorax is so dangerous, why it requires emergency treatment? The um, access, access air is just um, entering through a hole in the lungs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's part, definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know why it, it causes um, it causes the patient to have trouble with breathing and causes a decrease in the heart's ability to function? Okay, that's why we're here. We're gonna talk about it. Go ahead. I might have used Google a little bit, but it it results in a decrease of um, venous return to the heart. Venus Very good. To the heart. Yes. Very good, I like that. Yes, that is absolutely one reason why. So the reason why attention pneumothorax is so dangerous is because what happens during trauma, which is typically how attention pneumothorax is caused, um, it creates a hole in the, in the chest and the pleural, in the pleura. And the pleura is basically a sac that surrounds the lung. And what happens is when you have that hole, the patient is able to take a deep breath in and air is able to enter through that hole. However, this hole, what creates a tension pneumothorax is that it creates a one-way valve, so air can't escape. So you can imagine if you're taking a deep breath in, but you can't let the air out, it just gets trapped. And the more air that you breathe in, the more tension, the more pressure that you get in your chest. And what happens is not only do you have a collapsed lung, which is what a pneumothorax is, but the tension part comes from the increasing pressure that is like you mentioned on the venous system on your heart. It, so it prevents, um, it really prevents you from breathing appropriately and having the ability to perfuse your tissues or to get oxygen to your tissues and your brain. So does anybody have any questions about what I just said before I keep going. Okay, let's keep going. All right, and I have some pictures coming up here um, to show you what that looks like on imaging, but um, I wanna keep going with some of this first. So let's talk about the second item on our differential diagnosis, a pulmonary embolism. Does anybody have any idea what a pulmonary embolism is? Yeah, so the, the lungs is um, blocked by a blood clot, the, the arteries in the lungs, so very it's, it's a blood clot. Yeah, very good, absolutely. Yep, so does anybody have a guess, Jonathan, do you have a guess about what causes a PE or a common cause of a PE? Oh, that's okay. So maybe tra trauma, like you were talking about earlier. I mean, there would have to be some way for the blood to get into the lungs, right? Yeah, trauma is definitely a cause. Um, or in your textbooks, when you get to medical school, it'll be endothelial damage. Um, so when the body suffers trauma or um, stasis, for example, as in a patient isn't getting up and moving, does anybody have a guess about when a patient might not be able to get out of bed easily and they'd be kind of sitting around for too long? Double amputee. <laughs> yeah, yep, for sure surgery. So a patient that just had surgery is typically, or could be bed bound, depending on obviously what, what they had surgery for. Um, but 
if you guys are familiar with working in the hospitals, I don't know if you've seen patients kind of being forced to get up and move. And um, part of the reasoning for that is not only to help the patient recover um, in general, but to prevent blood clots from forming in the legs because what can happen is those blood clots can uh, break off or embolize and travel through the venous system and through the heart into the lungs. And then you can get a PE and PEs can be deadly. Um, sometimes, sometimes they're not immediately deadly and there are treatments for that, but um, depending on the size, they can be a pretty bad deal. All right, uh, and then I just wanna mention another cause of uh, developing a PE would be hypercoagulable states, meaning that the body is predisposed to clotting. Um, and another, besides endothelial damage and stasis like we just talked about, but there are certain conditions like pregnancy that can make patients uh, more predisposed to forming clots. Does anyone have an idea of why that might be the case for pregnant women? Think about when the when the mom gives birth, do they lose a lot of blood during that typically, or do they lose even just some blood? Um, is it because of the placenta secreting that's a, something? Yeah, that's a really good thought. Yeah, so it certainly could be part of when the when the mom sheds the placenta um, and there's a little bit of blood loss. So so yes, that's not wrong at all. Um, but it has to do with the mom, um, the body preparing to give birth and in that process losing blood, which is just kind of a natural part of the birthing process, whether it's, you know, um, tearing or something like that. So good. All right. And then in terms of the symptoms for a pulmonary embolism, does anyone have any guesses for what some symptoms might be? How would a patient present to you with this. Think about the lungs. So if, if something's going wrong with your lungs, do you think it'll be harder to breathe maybe? Have some shortness of breath or if we wanna pull out our medical words, dyspnea? So we're gonna have some shortness of breath or dyspnea, tachypnea, which means you're breathing quickly. Um, and just to, so for your reference, breathing quickly means you're breathing um, above 20 breaths a minute. That's typically considered tachypnea. Um, you'd also have a patient with pleuritic chest pain. Does anybody have an idea of what pleuritic chest pain means? Chest pain associated with the pleura? Yeah. Yeah. So, Cameron, tell me about the pleura. Um, what, what's the pleura? I mentioned it earlier, and it's okay if you don't remember. Yeah, I want to say it's something in between the lungs and the um, muscle, the diaphragm, but I could be wrong. That's, yeah. I would say essentially it's it's the sac that's that surrounds the lung, kind of between the chest wall and the lung. So very good. Um, yeah, so pleuritic chest pain would be pain, chest pain that increases with inspiration and exhalation. So keep that in mind if there ever is a, a lung issue and when you're developing your future differential diagnosis as emergency medicine physicians think about pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, or just a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. Good. And then a few other symptoms that a patient could have would be uh, a dry cough or hemoptysis, which means uh, bloody sputum, bloody phlegm that they're coughing up. And then um, jugular venous distension, which means that the neck veins are engorged because of increasing pressure um, in your chest cavity. And so basically your heart isn't able to circulate blood effectively because of that increasing pressure. And so you're getting a backup of blood. And so that can be a clue too. Good. All right. Well, let's talk about the last one, cardiac tamponade. Does anybody have an idea of what tamponade is? Feel free to use that, that picture as a cheat. Yeah. So I think it's the fluid surrounding the heart and is is 
like is is compressed and so it it drops the blood pressure very good yes very good exactly so um cardiac tamponade or pericardial tamponade is when fluid um usually blood accumulates in the sac around the heart so the heart you don't just have the heart sitting in your chest cavity it's covered by a membrane and there's like a pseudo space between the heart and um, this membrane called the pericardium. And sometimes if you, if that space is violated, like for example, with trauma, somebody getting stabbed or something going wrong in surgery, then blood can accumulate and compress the heart and prevent it from functioning properly. So um, you're gonna get similar symptoms to, for example, tension pneumothorax because um, your body is not getting the oxygen it needs because your heart isn't able to pump effectively. So um, in terms of some symptoms, I just want to highlight these symptoms to you because I want you to start to see as you're preparing to go to medical school that a lot of the, these disease processes can present in a similar way, which, which makes medicine so challenging, but so much fun too. Um, if you guys like puzzles, because medicine to me is like a puzzle. So um, in terms of symptoms, obviously the patient could have some shortness of breath um, they would have some chest pain, but it would not be pleuritic because it doesn't have to do with the lungs specifically. Um, they could have hypotension or low blood pressure, which is, for example, a systolic blood pressure um, less than 90. And then um, one key is muffled heart sounds. So I don't know if any of you guys have a stethoscope at home, um, or even if you just place your ear on someone's chest and just listen to the lub dub of their heart. Typically in a healthy patient that those heart sounds are clear. And in a patient with pericardial tamponade, cardiac tamponade, those heart sounds would be muffled. So they'd be, it, it wouldn't sound quite as clear as the typical lub dub. So that's a clue too. Um, and then a few other symptoms you could have would be distended neck veins. Like we also talked about for tension pneumothorax, when you get that buildup of pressure uh, because the heart can't pump, so blood's backing up and um, the neck veins get engorged. And then finally, tachycardia. So your heart's beating faster to try to compensate, but it can't expand properly because it's getting squished. All right, so here's our physical exam for the patient. So I wanna go through this with you guys. So let's take a look at the vital signs. Um, we have heart rate, we have blood pressure, we have respiratory rate, temperature, and then SpO2 is oxygen saturation. So I, I want you guys to tell me which of these you think is abnormal. And if you don't mind um, unmuting yourself to tell me, that would be great. Um, SpO2. Yeah. What, tell me more, what do you see in there, Lance? Um seems like they're sort of hypoxic because uh, shouldn't it be around like 98 or 99 almost? Absolutely. Or even for even for a healthy 22-year-old male who has, not that we know of any associated comorbidities or other um, health conditions, we would expect this patient to have a, a very high oxygen saturation. So very good. Yes, 82 is, is low. I think the uh, heart rate's a little high and blood pressure is a little low. Absolutely. Yeah, you're spot on. Heart rate is pretty high. So typically, um, I guess depending on the source that you use, but for me, I say above 100 beats per minute is considered to be tachycardic. So a patient who has tachycardia and who has uh, low blood pressure, as Cameron astutely pointed out, 70 over 45, that's a scary number something's not right. Um, so when you have heart rate of 119 and blood pressure 70 over 45 together, start thinking that this patient could be going into shock. So does anybody know what shock is? Uh, involuntary shutdown of the autonomic nervous system. That is not a bad guess at all. It, is act it actually has to do with um, the tissues in your body not getting the oxygen that they need uh, because of cardiovascular compromise or um, something's not right with, with your heart pumping. And when you get to medical school, you guys will learn that there are different categories of shock, but we won't get into that today. 
there'll be a date for that. So let's get into more of this physical exam. So we have general. So what I mean by general is that this is how the patient appears to you. What do you see? So the patient is in distress because they're unconscious. Their, their vital signs are telling you that they're going in shock or they're hypoxemic. Um, their blood oxygen saturation is way too low. Um, and they, per EMS, they recently became unresponsive to voice command or external stimuli. And so what I mean by external stimuli is when you have a patient that is unconscious um, or not responding to you, one way that you can try to interact with them and assess, you know, how serious is this? Can they wake up? Um, is by using um, external stimuli. And so one favorite of emergency medicine is the sternal rub. Um, and what you do is you take your knuckles and you put it on your ch the patient's chest and you push down pretty hard and you rub. So you guys should try that to yourself. Um, it hurts. That is, you know, if, if the patient is mildly sedated, you know, they would probably wake up to that and be like, what are you doing? That's really painful. But um, for a patient that doesn't respond to something as uh, painful as a sternal rub, then we know something is not good. All right, H-E-E-N-T. Does anybody know what that stands for? Yeah, um, the, the, head, the head neck exam, basically. Exactly, yep, very good. Yep, so essentially the neck and above. So I say, I describe the head as atraumatic, excuse me, excuse me, and normocephalic. So atraumatic is we looked over the patient's head. I didn't see any signs of, of trauma as in um, like open head wounds, evidence of blood, things like that. And normocephalic is referring to the shape of the patient's head. Um, so in this patient's case, it's, he has a normal head shape. Um, we noted distended neck veins, and we kind of talked about that already and, and how that um, has to do with attention pneumothorax. And then I put in the pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light bilaterally. Um, do you guys know how to test the pupils? Can anybody tell me how to test them? Exposure to light, see if they dilate. Yeah, exactly. This is like every Grey's Anatomy episode is they, you have them taking a flashlight and, and shining them in the patient's eyes. So very good. All right. Um, so sorry, I actually went to the next slide, but this is just highlighting some of the things that are abnormal, but we'll just keep going. So CV or cardiovascular, this is where we're listening to the patient's heart. Um, so what do we see? We see that the patient is tachycardic, like we talked about earlier. Distal pulses are faint, meaning when you go, when you guys are an emergency resident physician or even a medical student, you're helping out with a case in the trauma bay, you're going to feel for distal pulses. And what I mean by that are radial pulses, which here's your radial pulse. You guys can do it to yourself. Try to find, find your radial pulse. And then another example of that would be um, your pedal pulses, which are on the, um, the tops of your feet. So they're faint, which means that that's more evidence to us that something's not right with this patient's cardiovascular function. Something's preventing blood from, you know, moving effectively in the body. And then let's say I list capillary refill is greater than two seconds. Does anybody know... Uh, what capillary refill is or how to test it. Um, isn't that like when you press on your, on like the thumb pad of your hand and then you see how fast it like refills with blood? Exactly. Yes. Very good. So I typically use my finger. Um, I don't see why you couldn't use another part of your hand if that was preferable to you, but that's how I was taught is you pinch a patient's finger and you count the seconds it takes to pink up essentially. Um, and so for a normal patient, uh, less than two seconds is what we wanna see. But for this patient, it's greater than two, which is unfortunately more evidence that this patient is not doing well. Something's wrong with his heart. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Of course. Um, in the H E N T assessment, mm -hmm. do you is testing of the ears important? I mean, yes, absolutely, especially in a trauma case. Um, and can you do you have any guesses as to why? 
balance. <laughs> that's a good thought. So it'd be hard to assess balance if the patient was unconscious, but that's a really good thought. So um, looking inside the patient's ears is important because you want to see if there's any blood behind the tympanic membrane, um, which is a thin membrane that, um, if you guys haven't seen it, I would just try to Google a picture, but it's uh, a thin membrane that typically is kind of gray looking and um, has a light reflex, or, or you can see a little bit of reflected light from the otoscope. And so, um, yes, that's a really good thought. In, in real life, you would absolutely want to check both of the ears. Yeah, this is a shortened trauma uh, survey. So, does anyone have any other questions? All right, let's keep going. Okay, finally. Oh, and then peripheral edema. So, just briefly, peripheral edema means. Um, swelling in your extremities or in your arms, your hands, or your legs. I don't know if you guys have ever maybe eaten too much salt um, or at the end of the day, you take off your socks and you notice there's an imprint of, of your sock or your pants. And um, there's a little bit of edema there from, um, you know, being on your feet all day or whatever you were doing. But um, edema can be a sign of heart failure or heart problems in some patients. So it's always good to check for edema. And you do that by um, basically taking your finger and pushing down on their legs to see if, if it's like a doughy sensation or an, there's an imprint of your finger. That's evidence of edema. And now we finally get to the lungs. So this patient has absent breath sounds on the right side, meaning when you take your stethoscope and you auscultate the right, the right side, or you're listening with your stethoscope for heart, um, lung sounds, breath sounds, you don't hear any. Does anybody have any idea of why that is for this patient? Unconsciousness. What did you say? Unconsciousness. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's part of it too. So pneumothorax means collapsed lung and there are different variations or levels of what that means. You can have a partially collapsed lung um, and still be able to breathe somewhat effectively. And then you can have a completely collapsed lung, um, which in this case is what happened because the patient was stabbed in the chest. Um, that knife violated the pleura which is the sac surrounding the lungs, air was able to get into the chest, created that one-way valve that we talked about, and you got increasing pressure in the chest that's causing the lung to get even more squished and your, um, the other organs in your chest cavity to be squished and pushed over to the opposite side. So that's why there are no breath sounds on the right side. And for the same reason, uh, this patient also has hyperresonance to percussion. Um, and this is, I think, a little bit more antiquated, but um, what it's referring to is it. So when you are a medical student, you will learn that percussion is a physical exam tool that you can use in certain situations. For example, if you've ever been to the doctor and they took their hand and they kind of tapped it like this, um, and you could kind of hear the sounds that it made in your stomach. So that's what percussion is. And you can do it on your chest too. And so hyper-resonance to percussion would be that you can hear that sound. It's very distinct um, instead of being blunted by the organs that um, should be in, in that exact spot. But in this case, the lung is collapsed and there's a lot more air. So um, it makes the sound kind of reverberate more, if that makes sense. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? Okay, let's keep going. All right, so here's our assessment and plan. So we have, our attending says, yes, you are correct. This is a pneumothorax. So in a situation where the patient is hemodynamically stable, meaning that their blood pressure is within a reasonable um, level and they're not in immediate threat of death, then you would get a chest X-ray because this is the confirmatory test or the test to prove that the patient has a tension pneumothorax. However, this patient 
is going to die unless we do something immediately. And so, oh, we're gonna... do you have a question, Jonathan? Oh, no. Okay. Okay. So, um, you need to perform a, we're going to jump to B and perform the needle decompression. And so what that is, is you're taking um, a 16 gauge needle and you're inserting it into the second intercostal space along the mid clavicular line. So that's a lot of kind of like medical mumbo jumbo. So let's break down what that means. So second intercostal space. So you can count your ribs if you feel your chest and really it's as simple as that. So you count the first rib, you go down and that's the first intercostal space. And then you move to the second rib and move your fingers down. And it's, that is the second intercostal space. And so for this patient, um, oh, and then at the mid clavicular line, so you guys know where your clavicles are right here, are your clavicles. And so mid clavicular would just be in the middle of your clavicle. So you're gonna follow that down to um, the second intercostal space. And that's where you know to place your needle. That's the safe spot to place your needle. And so does anybody have a guess as to what will happen? What will we hear once we insert that needle into the second intercostal space? Like the hissing of air releasing? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure that's been in the movie, maybe you guys have seen it, but somebody collapses and they very dramatically take a pen and douse the spot in alcohol and then you hear the hissing noise and then they wake up. Um, so that's not exactly <laughs> what it looks like in real life, but essentially that is needle decompression. So that's the emergent procedure that we need to perform as soon as we suspect that this is a tension pneumothorax to save the patient's life. Everything else is second to that. And then as you can see um, in C, it says follow the procedure with placement of a chest tube. Um, does anybody know what, what's the utility of a chest tube? Why do, why do we want to use a chest tube after um, we get all that air out? Supply oxygen. That's a really good thought. Does anybody else have any guesses? It's to prevent that area from filling up with fluid, blood, or air again. Yeah, yep, really good thought. Yes, so when you do that needle decompression, if the patient has a tension pneumothorax, you're gonna hear that air. However, the lung is still mostly collapsed or at least partially collapsed. And so you need to give the body time to reinflate that lung and get that negative pressure back inside of the chest cavity. And negative pressure is important because that's what allows us to, when we take a deep breath in, it allows us to suck the air in. And then when we exhale, our, our lung our lungs um, collapse a little bit. That's what negative pressure allows us to do. And when we have a loss of negative pressure because um, of that hole created in the chest, um, the lungs aren't able to expand and contract as they normally would. So that's why we wanna use a chest tube. And then also, um, you know, if the patient had, for example, a hemothorax, which is when um, instead of air, you have blood in the chest cavity. For the same reason, you can use a chest tube to drain that blood and get, get that chest cavity back to the state that it needs to be in. All right, let's talk about pathology. So I know that we have already talked about a lot of this, but just, you know, to get familiar with this material, um, and to get you guys excited about medical school and your future careers, hopefully as EM physicians. Um, let's talk a little bit more about it. So can somebody tell me why tension pneumothorax is so dangerous? You're not getting enough oxygenation. Mm -hmm. Yep. What about what's happening in the chest cavity? We're increasing the pressure, so therefore you're getting less oxygen coming in. Exactly. So what you should have negative pressure normally. Yes, very good, very good. Um, so you're not getting, you're going into shock and you're not getting enough, um, your tissues are not getting enough oxygen because your heart is getting squished by that one-way valve that, let, that lets air in but not out. 
So you have a, that collapsed lung on the same side as the one-way valve or where the patient was stabbed. And um, all that pressure is moving your internal organs to the opposite side and they're getting squished so they don't work as well. Good. Can anybody tell me some of the symptoms that a patient might have with this? Uh, shortness of breath, chest pains, mm -hmm. um, JVD, as we talked about. Yep. Um, and then uh, the edema and the extremities. Close. So, so for this specific case, um, and in general, tension pneumothorax wouldn't traditionally present with edema or peripheral edema. Okay. Um, but it's a really good thought. So, peripheral edema can present in a lot of different conditions like heart failure. Um, but that was a good guess. Good. Anyone else have any other thoughts they want to share? Any questions at all on, on what we've talked about? Would it also present with uh, high blood pressure, or sorry, low blood pressure and high heart rate as we talked about earlier? Absolutely it would. Yes. Can you tell me why? High heart rate because the heart's trying to keep up with the lack of pressure as a result of the increased pressure in, inside of the chest cavity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yep. Yeah, the heart is trying to beat faster because it, it's not able to expand fully um, because it's getting squished by that increasing pressure in the chest from the one-way valve. Exactly. Good. And then on the slide here, um, just reviewing the one-way valve increasing pressure um, that leads to cardiac and respiratory failure like we talked about. And then um, typically I think from what I've learned at least, tension pneumothorax is often caused by traumas like stabbing or iatrogenic, meaning um, by a, a physician or the person caring for the patient like during uh, surgery, for example. But it can also be caused by barrel trauma. Does anybody know what barrel trauma means? Um, is that it has to do with the barrel receptors? Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Uh, it has to do with pressure. Yeah, very good. Yep. Yeah, you guys are both right. The barrel receptors monitor pressure. So you guys are on the same wavelength there. Um, very good. So barotrauma typically or can happen when a patient is on a ventilator. And unfortunately, I feel like you guys might be especially familiar with ventilators because of COVID going on right now. So patients who are placed on ventilators are having trouble breathing. And so um, they get a tube down their uh, trachea and it basically acts as their lungs. It, it, it inflates them and it um, sucks the air back out. And you have to have, measure the pressures and everything has to be just so. Um, and if the pressure is too high, that can pop the lung basically. Um, and that's what barotrauma is. Good. Okay. So evaluation, so a physical exam, we've talked We've talked a lot about physical exam um, and uh, vital signs. So we talked about hypotension, low blood pressure. Our patient had a systolic of 70 and a diastolic of 45. So the top and bottom numbers in the blood pressure. And those are low numbers for a patient. Can anyone give me an example of a normal blood pressure? 120 over 80. Yeah, yeah, that's a great blood pressure. Um, Good. Tachycardia, heart's beating too fast. Does anyone remember that threshold I mentioned for when it's when your heart 20 beats per minute? Sorry, what did you say? 20 beats per minute. So um, to be tachycardic, your heart rate is, it depends, I think, on where you look, but it's either above 90 beats per minute or 100 beats per minute. That's considered tachycardia. Um, diminished distal pulses. So from that increasing pressure, um, you know, your heart's not able to pump effectively. And so um, there's just not a lot of blood flow going into your extremities, into your arms and legs. And so trying to find your radial pulses or trying to find your pedal pulses, um, which are on your feet, 
would be a lot more difficult in a patient with attention pneumothorax. Um, they could also definitely present with shortness of breath, um, hypoxia, like the uh, blood oxygen saturation that our patient had in this case, which was 82%, which is really low. That's a scary number for such a young, such a young patient. And then um, unfortunately going into cardiorespiratory failure, like we talked about. Um, in terms of our imaging, so we know that if the patient is stable, they're not immediate, we're not worried that they're immediately going to die if we don't do our needle decompression, we can get a chest x-ray because the chest x-ray is our confirmatory test. It's the test that will tell us if, if we are right that this patient definitively has a pneumothorax or attention pneumothorax. And then in terms of our treatment, we kind of talked about this too. Um, in this situation, when you guys are an emergency medicine resident or attending, um, and you suspect that a patient has attention pneumothorax, you use your clinical judgment, you trust your clinical judgment instead of going to a test like the chest x-ray, and you do that needle decompression um, at the second uh, intercostal space along the midclavicular line. So we talked about how to find um, you count, you essentially just count the ribs. You use your fingers on the patient to find rib number one, then go below. That's the first intercostal space. And intercostal means between the ribs. Good. And then placement of a chest tube um, is on the fourth or fifth intercostal space at the mid axillary line. So does anybody know what the axilla is? What is that? I'll tell you. I, I had a quick question regarding yeah, tachycardia. Yeah. Um, would somebody who just got finished working out be considered tachycardic if they had a high blood pressure? Or right, sorry, high blood high heart rate. Yeah, there you go. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, if you're if you're doing it right, you want to get that heart rate up. Um, in terms of like disease pathologies or trauma when a patient is, you know, for example, resting in a bed in the emergency department, they're just sitting there, but their heart rate's going really fast and their blood pressure is really low. Those are clues to you that something is not right. But for a healthy young 22 year old, um, you know, when you're working out, it's, it's a good thing to get your heart rate up. Absolutely. Um, so we were talking about um, the I had a question as well. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so for this patient, um, would they all also be acidic as well? Since their heart rate's so high, they're producing like more lactate than normal, or like does that have anything to do with this like being treated? That's a really good thought. So lactate is something that's produced when your tissues um, don't get enough oxygen. And your body has a little bit of a, a reserve, but um, if you go for too long in either a certain area of your body or your entire body is not getting enough oxygen, then you could definitely start producing lactate, which um, when you guys take biochemistry, you'll learn about how cells sometimes use an anaerobic metabolism when oxygen is not available. Um, so that's a really good thought. And that is actually a, a test that physicians that you guys will one day use um, to assess your patients is you will draw lactate and that's kind of a marker for um, how sick somebody is. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't, oh, absolutely. I can't remember if I told you what the axilla is. <laughs> the axilla is your armpit. That's what the axilla is. So when we say mid axillary line, what we mean is you find the patient's armpit and mid axillary just means the midline or in the middle. And you count down to the fourth or fifth intercostal space. And that's where you're gonna take your scalpel and make an incision and then feed your chest tube into that spot. So you can drain the air or blood or whatever is in the chest cavity that you need to get rid of to allow the lung to reinflate. Good. Okay, guys. What do you see? Let's start with the left side first. What do you guys see here? Uh, 
Uh, looks like a collapsed lung on the left side. Like the left lower lobe is damaged. Um, are we talking about this one? Can you see my mouth? Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Here, yeah, try it. Try again. I can see that looks like a pretty cool. I didn't hear you. Will you say that again, please? I was going to say that looks like a pretty clean x ray. Yeah, I would agree with you. This is a normal x-ray and I want to talk to you guys briefly about how to read a chest x-ray and there are a lot of different mnemonics for how people like to do it and you'll certainly develop your own method when you guys are med students and you start your third year clinical rotations um, and you're attending I don't know if you guys have heard of pimping but that's where they kind of put you on the spot and ask you a question, um, but they'll say, hey, can you read this chest x-ray for me? What do you see? So let's talk briefly about how to do that. So first thing we, we can do is let's use our ABCs again. Let's start with that. So let's start with the airway. So here we have the airway. This is a trachea and it looks good. It looks good. It looks midline. It looks like it's in the middle. It's not moved off to one side or the other, which is really good. And you can kind of see where the trachea breaks off into the right and left main stem uh, bronchi. Um, that specific spot is called the carina. And it's a little hard to see, but essentially it's coming off right here. And that's going um, into the, the smaller branches of the lung. So that's our airway. Does anyone know what B might stand for? Bronchioles. It's a really good thought. Breathing. Breathing. That's a really good thought too. Um, and you know what, to be fair, in your own mnemonic, you could definitely have breathing, but in this case, I'm gonna say bones. So what I mean by bones is you take a look specifically at the clavicles, for example, check if there are any fractures there. If you see any hairline fractures, um, which would just be kind of a thin line. Otherwise you could see, you know, like major problems to big breaks. Um, and then also checking each rib as best you can. And this is a pretty good x-ray to look at the ribs um, and they look pretty good. Good, well, let's move on to C. What do, what do you guys think C stands for? Cardiac. Yeah, very good. Good job, Riley. Yes, cardiac. So with this, we want to look at the cardiac silhouette. And here it is in all its glory. It looks good. It looks like a normal size. And that's something that you guys will be able to recognize after you look at, you know, a million different chest x-rays. Um, we see this is the aortic knob here, um, which is normal. And that's good. So yeah, I don't see the heart doesn't look like it's super enlarged. Can anybody think of an example of, of when the heart might be especially large or um, if you guys have heard of cardiomegaly or cardiac hypertrophy, any guesses? It's a hard question. Heart failure. Yeah, very good. Yes, exactly, Cameron, heart failure. Um, yep, so the heart is working extra hard to pump blood and over time, it gets bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger. And I encourage you guys to just Google uh, what that looks like um, in a patient with heart failure. And it can be shocking how big some people's hearts can get. So very good, that's our cardiac silhouette. So we have A, B, C, and now we have D. Does anyone have an idea of D? What's the, what could D stand for? Diaphragm. Distension. Diaphragm, yes. Yes, distension's not, not a bad thought, um, but that's more of a physical exam finding, like when a, um, a patient's belly is, you know, super kind of inflated, that would be a distended abdomen. But good guess. Yes, so diaphragm is what we're talking about. And here it is. There it is. It's nice and clean. We can see um, it's outlined very well. This spot right here, if you guys can see my mouse, mouse is called the costophrenic angle. And in a chest x-ray, we like to see that this is very sharp. We can see it quite clearly. 
Um, in a patient who has pneumonia, for example, they could have a consolidation um, or an infection or um, in a chest x-ray, it could be like a hazy spot, for example. Um, and that could blunt the costophrenic angle and make it look uh, or make it more difficult to identify those edges. So this is, this is a really good looking chest x-ray. Um, everything looks good so far. And then E stands for everything else. Good, very good. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, excuse me, we, we have to do the, the coolest one. We need to talk about the right side. So we've talked about what's normal. So can somebody just give me a couple of things or one thing that, that you see on this chest x-ray that doesn't look quite right to you? It looks like the left lobe um, is collapsed on the lung because you're saying the extreme white spots or the, the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're looking at a chest x-ray, um, it's actually what you're looking at is the right side. So the left side is where your heart is and the right side is, it's like the opposite, um, if that makes sense. And it's totally fine. It just takes practice to learn how to read them. So this is the right side of the chest just like in our patient who had that collapsed lung. So this is um, actually from a patient with a tension pneumothorax. And um, right here, you can see all this empty space, really. You don't see any of those white lines that we have over here. Um, and these are what are called just normal lung markings, um, which has to do with the vasculature in your lungs. And th this is uh, pretty normal, but we don't have any of that here. And so this is telling me that the lung has collapsed. We have a pneumothorax here. Um, what else do you guys see? So um, I actually thought what Lance thought as well, considering all of the white space on the left side of the patient's body. Mm -hmm. um, and so what would that be? Would that just be fluid? That's a really good question. So because I don't know this patient's specific history, I'm just going to tell you what I think it is. Um, so I think that this is the patient's lung that's being pushed up. It's being because of all this air here um, that's increasing the pressure in this patient's chest. It's pushing. It's pushing the organs. It's pushing the heart. It's pushing the trachea even to the opposite side. Whereas in this normal chest x-ray, we see that it's, you know, right in the midline or right in the middle, which is normal. So everything's getting squished over here. Um, it's not a bad thought to think that there could be some fluid because fluid uh, does have a more of a white look. So I can't tell you that you're wrong. If that makes sense. Sorry, that's kind of... No, understood. So black usually indicates more air. Yes, exactly. Okay. Black is air. Yep, very good. And this is actually kind of a tricky x-ray because this is a portable x-ray. And um, by portable, what I mean is the x-ray technician brings in um, an x-ray machine to the patient in the trauma bay. So we can get a picture right then and there instead of bringing them to the radiology suite. Um, and so the quality is not quite as good, unfortunately, but in an emergent situation, if you need a picture right away, it's better than nothing. Good. Does anybody else have any questions at all? No? Okay. Um, and then I just want to point out too, if you notice, this is all, this has been completely whited out here and we don't see that costophrenic angle um, on the opposite side. So just wanted to point out the difference to you um, for when you guys are looking at chest x-rays. slide here. So I love comics. I don't know how you guys feel about comics, but um, when you guys are in medical school, you'll learn that there are so many resources to help you learn all this stuff. And um, for me, I thought that drawings um, help me remember stuff better than just reading it in a textbook, um, just visualizing things. Yeah, I know. Um, so 
this is from medcomic.com and it's essentially talking about all the things that we already talked about regarding attention pneumothorax. We see this one-way valve here. Air is rushing in through this hole in the pleura. Um, you see this, this little drum um, that's um, personifying hyperresonance or that echoing sound, the, the extra echoing that you can hear when you do percussion. Decreased breath sounds because the lung is collapsed, it's getting squished, so it can't expand like the other side might be able to do a little bit better. So you're not hearing the normal sound of air coming in and out. And then we have tracheal deviation, which is when you have that increasing pressure. And like I showed you guys in the last slide, in a normal chest x-ray, what you see is the trachea is nice and in the middle. We like to see that. If it's moved off to the side, that is a bad sign and something's not going right. And then the lung is very unhappy because it's like, we need to put this chest tube in, right? Um, but don't forget, we have to do needle decompression first, then we can put the chest tube in. Very good. That's it guys, that's all I have for you. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry, my cat just walked in. Yeah, I mean, this isn't really in regards to the presentation more. I'm just confused as to what um, the subjective objective assessment slash plan is sure. on the, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I remember when I was learning you know, how to write a patient note and what was in each section that that was kind of confusing to me too. So that's a really good question. So the subjective of a patient's note of the SOAP note is all the information that the patient tells you. So what I mean by that is um, their HPI or their history of present illness. And that's how you would say um, John Doe is a 22 year old male who presents today with a chief complaint of abdominal pain or something like that. And then you go into the details of what they tell you. When did their symptoms start? What makes it better or their pain better or worse? What does their pain feel like? Does the pain radiate anywhere in their body? What have they tried taking um, for pain management? Oh my God, I'm really sorry, my cat. Um, what do they try taking for pain management? Like Tylenol, ibuprofen. So that's part of the subjective. Other parts of the subjective would be um, aspects of the patient's past medical history. So what other conditions have they had um, or been treated for like high blood pressure or um, high cholesterol, for example. Also considering other aspects like their social history. Do they drink alcohol? Do they smoke? Um, what allergies do they have? Do they have allergies to medications? Do they have allergies to like seasonal allergies or to pet dander, things like that. And so basically the S or the subjective is what the patient tells you. The objective, excuse me, is what you find yourself. And that would be where you would put, excuse me, your physical exam. So like we talked about with our tension pneumothorax patient, um, putting in, in uh, the first section, which is general. How does the patient look to you? Um, in a physical exam, what you guys will learn is that you typically um, always check three or four things. So you always have general, how does the patient present or appear to you? Do they seem their stated age? Are they in any distress? Um, you check their lung function too. You listen to their lungs, you listen to their heart. Those are basic things that you do. And then depending on what their chief complaint is, you might do an abdominal exam. You might, um, you might check their musculoskeletal function if they have knee pain or something like that. For our assessment and plan, our assessment is our differential diagnosis. So we, today we talked about tension pneumothorax, we talked about pulmonary embolism, and we talked about um, cardiac pericardial tamponade. So that's in our assessment. And um, this might vary depending on where you go to school, but typically you put them in order of most likely to least likely. And then in your plan, your plan is what do we want to do to help this patient feel better? Do I want to order labs? Do I want to get a chest x-ray? Um, do I want them to follow up with me in two weeks? So I know that was a lot of information, but that's kind of big picture of what a soap note is. Does that help? Yeah, it definitely helps me better in understanding just in general. Um, Good. Yeah. 
awesome. Do you have any quick tips on like how to study? Because it's a lot of information coming at you in med school. So. Totally. Well, that's a loaded question because I, it's a little different for everyone. Um, for me, my first, the, so the first two years of medical school are all essentially book learning. So you're going to be at your med school and the, your primary focus is going to be to learn the different pathologies, all the different diseases, and get a really good understanding of, of the book knowledge so that when you're a third and fourth year, you can go out into the hospital working with patients and physicians and residents um, and be able to participate actively in the patient's care. So first, the first two years, I found it really beneficial to um, work with other students. Um, and actually, that's kind of where my passion for teaching came from was we, my friends and I would, we would kind of pick a topic um, of what we were learning and we would present it to each other. And not only is there some pressure because, you know, you want to look like you know what you're talking about, but um, it forced you to learn and it forced you to be able to articulate effectively, hopefully, to your classmates about how to what does all this mean? Um, and being able to break it down in your own words, I think, is really helpful. So that's what I would say for that. And then third and fourth year are just kind of, it's a little different. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you guys so much for being a part of tonight. Um, really excited that we now have virtual rounds and we're very excited to work with you guys and support you on your journey to medical school. So good luck to all of you. Feel free to reach out with any questions. And um, I wish you guys all the best. Stay safe. Thank you, Emma. Look Thanks, forward to doing this again. Absolutely. I can't wait. Hope to see all of you guys back. Thank you, Emma. Have a good night, everyone.